everybody, what's good? What's going on? JB here with another Cyber Insight live stream. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different than we've done the past few weeks or, or months uh, when we've been going through the different Try Hack Me rooms, focusing on the Pen Test Plus curriculum. I figured today uh, it would be good to actually take a practice test, aim for those that are preparing for the Pen Test Plus certification. So I actually found one online uh, that was put out by Jason Dion. Uh, if you aren't familiar with him, he has tons of great uh, learning tutorials, classes, practice tests, and stuff like that over on Udemy. Actually, uh, I'll put a link in the description down below for you to go check out his stuff. Well, I found one of his online that was supposedly a free one. Um, I checked with him to make sure it was okay for me to use it uh, on the stream today, and he was cool with that, so I, I, I do appreciate that. So we're going to jump into that and just uh, go through, and hopefully, uh, you know, these questions, I think, uh, will hit on most of the main points uh, that the Pentest Plus covers. Um, obviously, in studying for this, you want to make sure that you're doing multiple practice exams and stuff like that, but this at least will give you a little bit uh, of an idea of the type of questions and the type of content that's covered under it. So. Uh, as always, before we hop over into that, make sure you smash the like button, subscribe if this is your first time here. And as we're going through this, if you have any questions or comments, uh, throw those uh, down below or in the comment section or whatever. And uh, yeah, just come drop in and say hello and uh, we'll kind of go from there. So uh, I'm going to move over to my browser here and we can kind of hop into it. So it's actually been, uh, it's been a minute since we've done any practice tests here. I think... Uh, before we kind of did a whole bunch of Juniper ones and we did uh, an Azure one. So I think this is the first one that we've done uh, probably since the, the Mist AI one. Um, so I'm just gonna read through these and we can kind of uh, flip back and forth. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but for the uh, this practice exam itself, I actually have the link for this in the description as well. So uh, you can obviously go and, and do this after the fact uh, as well if you want to. So, all right, let's get into it. Uh, question one, you have been hired as a penetration tester by an organization that wants you to conduct a risk assessment on their DMZ. The company provides a rules of engagement, states that you must do all penetration testing from an external IP address without being given any prior knowledge of the internal IT system architecture. What type of penetration test is this that you are hired to perform? All right, so the options here are white box, gray box, black box, uh, black box or uh, red team. So when we're looking at uh, different types of engagements, hey Kev, what's up? I see you uh, dropping in. Uh, if you do not have any type of information, so this is this is talking about being external and not be giving any information, then that is going to be a black box test. Uh, if it's something where you actually do have a whole bunch of information about the inside and you have credentials and all that type of stuff, that's going to be more white box test. And then somewhere in between is kind of a gray box test. So let's go and take a look. We're going to try and be cute with the way that we look at this answer key here. And I hope everybody can see that on the screen. I don't know if you can. There we go. So, all right. So that was D, which is correct. Okay. Uh, let me make sure that you are able to see that too. Okay, cool. Uh, question two, what is a common uh, SOAP vulnerability service oriented architecture protocol? Uh, Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, VPath injection, um, or XML denial of service issue. Um, for some reason, when I think of SOAP, I think of XML. So I'm gonna go with that and we'll see how we do there. So that would be, um, that would be D. Oh, let's not scroll up too far there. Yep, so that is D as well. Okay. Question three, what should be done uh, if the final set of security controls does not eliminate all of the risk in a given system, uh, should you continue to apply additional controls until the risk is zero? The risk is never zero. Um, uh, you should ignore any remaining risk. Well, ignoring risk isn't normally that great of an idea. Uh, you should accept the risk if the residual risk is low enough, or you should remove the current controls since they are not completely effective. I love answer D. 
Uh, but I'm going to say that you should accept the risk as long as the residual risk is low enough. And let's see. That looks like C to me. All right, question four. An organization is currently accepting bids for a contract that will involve penetration testing and reporting. The organization is asking all bidders to provide proof of previous penetration testing and reporting experience. One contractor decides to print out a few reports from some previous penetration tests that they performed. Oh, that's no good. Uh, what could have occurred as a result of this contractor's actions? Um, a lawsuit. That's what could have occurred. Uh, the contractor will have their bid accepted with a special pay bonus because of their excellent work on the previous penetration tests. Yeah, uh, especially if it's a competitor. Um, the contractor will have uh, inadvertently exposed numerous vulnerabilities they had found at the other companies uh, on previous assessments. I think that sounds good. Uh, the organization accepting the bids will want to use reports as an example format for all bidders use it now. The company accepting the bids will hire the contractor because of the quality of the reports he had submitted in the bid. Uh, no, we're going to go with B on that as, uh, yeah, they're exposing things that they shouldn't be exposing. All right, that looks like B. What is a formal document that states what will and will not be performed during a penetration test? So statement of work or SOW, MSA, NDA, corporate policy. Um, I'm sure that we'll get a few more questions like this, so I might as well break down, at least from my perspective, what each of these is. So statement of work or SOW is actually what's going to be telling you what will or won't be performed uh, during an engagement. And MSA, I think, is a little bit more of a higher level um, contract kind of for future work and stuff like that. NDA or non-disclosure agreement is going to cover what information uh, is, I don't necessarily want to say secret, but controlled information that shouldn't be shared. Um, and corporate policy is just, I don't know, whatever type of corporate policy you might have on something. So, uh, we are going to go with a on that for, uh, SOW. Okay. Uh, question six, what is a legal contract outlining the confidential material or information that will be shared by the pen tester and the organization during the assessment? So like I said, um, anything confidential uh, is going to be covered under an NDA or non-disclosure agreement. And that was C. Yep. Okay. Uh, what is not a step in uh, the NIST SP 800-115 methodology? Uh, planning, discovery, reporting, scoping. All right, so I'm not so hot on the uh, 800-115. I'm going to say that reporting and discovery definitely sounds correct. Planning and scoping sound very similar to me, but I would think like scoping is something that you do within your planning phase. So since we're kind of going high level here, let's go um, D, scoping is something that's not there. Yep. All right, question eight. What is not an example of a type of support resource that a pen tester might receive? Um, as part of a white box assessment. Network diagrams, SOAP project files, XSD, or PII of employees. Yeah, so uh, remember white box assessment is where they're going to give you a whole bunch of information um, about stuff on the inside. So con configurations, documentation, probably accounts to be able to log in stuff. Um, I am going to say uh, PII of employees is something that is not actively given out. Um, hey, Kev, I see your question. I'm going to throw it up here in a second once I just double check this. So we were saying eight is D, PII. Yep, D. All right, so Kev's coming in with a question here. What, that's the same thing, talking about the scoping and, whoa, uh, talking about the scoping and planning. 
Um, so I think, well, obviously this is going to come down to like a, just a right or wrong answer as far as what actually are the steps that are in 815. So if scoping isn't a step, then it's wrong, even though, you know, you could argue that they mean the same thing. Um, I would also say that planning might actually have, um, other actions that, that come along with it right? Besides just scoping. So there might be other types of meetings or communications that happen outside of the actual act of uh, just scoping something. Okay. Uh, question nine. Let's get that. Okay. Question nine. Uh, what type of uh, assessment seeks to validate a system security posture against a particular checklist? Compliance-based, objective-based, goal-based, red team. All right, so whenever you're talking about measuring it against something, um, some type of standard or some type of legal requirement or something like that, that's going to be compliance-based. Um, so that might be like uh, PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance. If you're in the government space, it could be stuff related to CIS benchmarks or STIGs or something like that. Um, I think that that probably is what that's going to be. So let's go nine and a. Okay, that is correct. Okay. Uh, what type of threat actor is highly funded and often backed by nation states? APTs, hacktivists, script kiddies, or insider threats? Um, advanced persistent threats, APT. Um, hacktivists normally are working for some type of uh, political or social cause. Script kiddies are just, you know, normally folks who find uh, scripts out on the internet or stuff like that and do stuff for fun. And then insider threat obviously uh, is somebody within your organization that might be compromised for whatever reasons or trying to do things for financial gain. So let's go 10 and A. I'm gonna scroll this up because this is kind of hard for me going back and forth like that. We just won't look ahead at the other answers <laughs> uh, and we'll just hop back and forth, so no cheating. Um, all right. Uh, question 11, if you are unable to ping a target because you are receiving no response or a response that states the destination is unreachable, uh, then ICMP may be disabled on the remote end. If you wanted to try to elicit a response from a host using TCP, which tool would you use? Um, well, it wouldn't be a broadcast ping. It wouldn't be traceroute because that uses ICMP. Um, I'm not sure what TCP ping is, so let's go H ping. Uh, question 11, so that will be A. And 11 is A, okay. Um, what system contains a publicly available set of databases with registration contact information for every domain name on the internet? Uh, so who is IANA, CAPTCHA, or IETF? So who is? Um, is going to be pretty sure what the answer to that is going to be. IANA is normally in charge of IP addresses. CAPTCHA is something that uh, we end up seeing on websites for you to prove that you're not a computer. And uh, IETF normally deals with different types of frameworks or standards, um, I believe. So 12A. 12A. Penetration tester hired by a bank uh, begins. There we go. A penetration tester hired by a bank begins searching for the bank's IP ranges by performing lookups on the bank's D, uh, DNS servers, reading news articles, monitoring what times the bank employees come and leave work, searching job postings, searching corporate offices, uh, the bank's dumpsters. Uh, based on this description, what portion of the penetration test is being conducted? Uh, information reporting. Nope, that would be done at the end. Vulnerability assessment, no, because they're looking for information at this point. So that leaves us active information gathering or passive information gathering. 
I think the difference here is passive information gathering is normally going to be from like open source stuff, things that are readily available for you to find, which it seems all of these things here are. Um, so let's go with 13 and D. Yep, 13 D. You have conducted a Google search for uh, the site colon web server dot com and then hyphen site colon sales dot web server dot com. Uh, I believe that's then space financial. Uh, what results would you expect to receive? Google results matching all words uh, in the query. Google results matching financial in the domain uh, web server dot com, but no results from the site uh, sales dot web server dot com. Google results for keyword matches from site sales web server dot com that are in the domain web server dot com, but do not include the word financial. Um, and Google results for the keyword matches on web server dot com and sales web server dot com that include the word financial. All right. So right off the bat, we're going to say a is not correct. Um, because we do have that financial keyword there. So we can, we can drop that off. Um, Google results for keyword matches uh, in this one, but do not include the word financial. We're going to knock that one out because it will include the word financial. Um, so that leaves us with B, matching financial in the domain web server, but no results from the site sales um, or keyword matches on web server.com and sales. Um, we're going to say not including the site since we using a hyphen site there. So it will be everything under this domain, excluding that part of the domain, that website that includes the word financial. So we're going to go 14 B and yep, 14 B. Uh, what command could be used to list the running services from the Windows command prompt? Um, so we got sc query type equals running, sc query, and then uh, backslash backslash server name, sc query, or sc config. Um, Uh, I'm going to guess on this one because I'm not exactly sure. I don't think it's SC config since we have SC query in these three. Mm, let's go just a basic one, SC query, 15C. Shot in the dark. 15C, cool. Got lucky on that one. Uh, Windows file servers commonly hold sensitive files, databases, passwords, and more. What common vulnerability is used uh, or usually used against a Windows file server to expose sensitive files, databases, and passwords? All right, so we're talking Windows here. Um, Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, uh, CRLF injection. So, with cross-site scripting and, and SQL injection, I normally think that that's going to be dealing with websites and then databases be behind that. I mean, for the SQL injection, CRLF, I don't remember what that is. Windows always has really a lot of vulnerabilities that need to be patched. So let's go uh, 16C, missing patches. Uh, 16C, cool. Cybersecurity analyst is applying for a new job uh, with a penetration testing firm. You received the job application as a secured Adobe PDF file, but unfortunately the firm locked the file with a password so the potential employee cannot fill in the application. Instead of asking for an uh, unlocked copy of the document, the analyst decided to write a script in Python to attempt to unlock the PDF file by using passwords from a list of commonly used passwords until he can find the correct password or attempts every password in his list. Based on this description, what kind of cryptographic attack did the analyst perform? Well, if you're using a list to try to guess passwords, that's gonna be normally what's called a dictionary attack. So let's see what they got here. Man in the middle attack, nope. Brute force attack, nope. 
dictionary attack yes session hijacking no uh, so let's go 17 C and there it is 17 C An ethical hacker has been hired to conduct a physical penetration test of company. During the first day of the test, the ethical hacker dresses up like a plumber and waits in the main lobby of the building until an employee goes through the main turnstile. As soon as the employee enters his access number and proceeds to go through the turnstile, the ethical hacker follows them through the access gate. What type of attack did uh, the hacker utilize to access the restricted area of the building? Uh, man trap, tailgating, shoulder surfing, social engineering. It's not social engineering. Um, I mean, maybe kind of, but really what he did was he tailgated through the, the turnstile, through the door. Um, not shoulder surfing. So let's go tailgating, 18B. Man trap is, is kind of like a, uh, I'm trying to think how to put it. Uh, it's an area in the building that has two doors that you're able to use to control uh, entry and exiting. And so you aren't able to badge, you badge in through one door, you wait for that to close, and then you're able to badge out through the other door. So it kind of, you're able to control who's going through uh, that space. And normally you do it one at a time. Uh, let's see what the answer is here. Uh, 18, and I was saying it was going to be B. 18A. So they have that as man trap. I don't think that's the correct answer. Um, could argue, I, I don't know. That's what they say. I would go with tailgating. I'll look that up later just to double check it, but it seems like tailgating to me. Um, let's see. Through which type of method is information collected during a passive reconnaissance? Uh, social engineering, network traffic sniffing, man in the middle attacks, public accessible uh, sources. So remember active and passive reconnaissance. We talked about that, I think on one of the other questions. I said passive reconnaissance is dealing with like publicly accessible data. So I think that that would fit that for D. So let's go with that, 19D, 19D. Okay, what type of attack is an example of IP spoofing? SQL injection, no. Man in the middle, probably. Cross-site scripting, no. Art poisoning. Um, yeah, so man in the middle attack, you're going to have somebody normally, I mean, it could be spoofing your IP address and then almost acting as a proxy. So, uh, yeah, let's go 20B. 20B. Okay, cool. All right, that's 20 questions down. I'm going to take a little uh, sip of some water here. If anybody has any questions up through this point, then you can go ahead and throw those in the chat. And if not, then we can get back at it. All right. Uh, question 21. What type of scan will measure the size or distance of a person's external features with a digital video camera? Iris scan. Nope. That has to do with the eye. Retinal scan. Nope. That has to do with the eye. Uh, facial recognition scan or signature uh, kinetic scan. Uh, so that would be dealing with, like, I believe, your actual signature. So the only one dealing with uh, external features of the face would be a facial recognition scan. So let's give that a look. 21C. Yep, 21C. What uh, technique does a vulnerability scanner use in order to detect a vulnerability on a specific service? Port scanning, banner grabbing, fuzzing, or analyzing the response received uh, from the service when probed. All right, so port scanning isn't actually going to do anything to detect any type of vulnerability. It's just going to see what ports are open. Um, banner grabbing, I don't think so either. I mean, um, not all ports are going to have, or services are going to have a banner that you're going to be able to grab, and the information in the banner might not be indicative of what actually might be on the device. So that doesn't seem right. Fuzzing is when you send a whole bunch of crazy information to something to see if you can kind of break stuff. So I, I don't think that's it. Analyze the response received from the service one probe. Let's go with that. Uh, 22D. Uh, yep. 
All right, a cybersecurity analyst at a mid-sized uh, retail chain has been asked to determine how much information can be gathered from the store's public web server. The analyst opens up the terminal on his Kali Linux workstation and decides to use Netcat to gather some information. So he Netcats to the web server, uh, the URL over port 80, does a head, HTTP, okay, so uh, what type of action did the analyst perform based on the command and response below? Cross-site scripting attack? Definitely not. Uh, banner grabbing? Yes. SQL injection attack? Definitely not. And query the Whois database? No. So he made just a connection over port 80 um, and it ended up pulling back the banner from the web server. That's what he did. Um, so that is 23B. 23B. Consider the following snippet from a log file collected on the host with the IP address of 10.10.3.6. All right, so we got timestamps, whole bunch of ports that look like they're kind of going a little bit in sequential order, all from the same source, 3.2, all going to the same destination using protocol TCP. So uh, what type of activity occurred? Uh, port scan targeting 10.10.3.2? Uh, nope, because that's the source, so that's not being targeted. Fragmentation attack targeting 10.10.3.6? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, fragmentation attack probably would just be to a single port, uh, not to a whole range of ports. Denial of service attack targeting 10.10.3.6. I don't see anything in here that indicates it being a denial of service attack. Port scan targeting 10.10.3.6. I would definitely say that's what it is, is a port scan. Since you see it kind of going sequentially and hitting some other popular port numbers. So let's go 24D. Yep. Let's see if we can fit that all on the screen. There we go. Okay. A uh, cybersecurity analyst is conducting a port scan of 192.168.1.45 using Nmap. During the scan, the analyst found numerous ports open and the Nmap software was unable to determine the operating system version of the system installed at 1.45. You've been asked by the analyst to look at the results of their Nmap scan. All right, so what do we got here? Nmap scan, we got the IP address that's going to 1.45. Uh, ports showing open. 21, 23, so FTP, Telnet, SMTP, HTTP, some NetBIOS stuff, some stuff that might look like printer stuff. Let's see, okay. Um, what is the likely operating system uh, for the host? So uh, Windows Server, um, possibly. Uh, Linux Server, uh, well, with it running NetBIOS, I would say not. Um, Windows Workstation, I mean maybe, and then like I said those to me look like possibly printer printer ports. So let's go with uh, let's go with a printer, uh, which is a good point. Um, you want to make sure <laughs> that you configure your printers in a lockdown manner where you don't have all of those services open on it because that's that's no good. Uh, let's see 25D. Yep, printer. Okay, you walked up behind a, a penetrator tester uh, in your organization and see the following output on their Kali terminal. So we got an, a, some type of attempt from a tool going to an individual IP address with a login of a, uh, one type of account and it looks like doing a whole bunch of random password attempts and then switches over to another user and again tries to do random password attempts. So what do we got going on here? Uh, conducting a port scan to dot 162. No, we're not trying to do a port scan. Conducting a brute force login attempt of a remote service on 192.162, that might be it. Conducting a ping sweep, nope. And conducting denial of service attack. I don't think that's it either. I think they're trying to brute force their way in. Uh, so let's see, that was 26B. And 26B. Okay, 
27. Security analyst wants to implement a layered defense posture for the network. So they decide to use multiple layers of antivirus defense, including both the end user antivirus software and an email gateway scanner. What kind of attack would this approach help to mitigate? Uh, forensic attack? I don't think so. I don't know. The ARP spoofing attack? No, that wouldn't stop ARP spoofing attack. Um, a social engineering attack? Maybe. I don't know. A scanning attack? I don't think it would stop that either. Um, I guess if they socially engineered you to do something bad on your workstation, you still have the possibility of the antivirus picking it up someplace else at the gateway scanner, maybe? I, I don't know. That's a guess. Uh, so let's go 27C, social engineering attack. All right, 27C, social engineering attack. Really, yeah, I don't know. I definitely know it wouldn't have been ARP spoofing. Um, and I don't think it would have been scanning attack. So maybe forensic attack, but they, they say it's social engineering attack. So we'll go with it. Uh, what technique is most effective in determining whether or not increasing end user security training would be beneficial to the organization during your technical assessment of their network? Um, so what type of technique would be most official uh, or most efficient? Vulnerability scanning, social engineering, application security testing, or network scanning. Well, obviously we're dealing with end users. And so if you can show that you were able to convince the end user to do something bad via social engineering, then that would be an effective way to do that. So let's go 28B. Yep. 29. What type of malicious application does not require user intervention or another application to act as a host in order for it to replicate? A macro, a worm, a Trojan, a virus. All right, uh, a few key words, I think, here. Um, does not require user intervention or another application and replicate. Um, whenever I think of replication, for the most part, I'm thinking of a worm, and a worm also does not need uh, any type of intervention. So let's go with, let's go with that, 29B. What kind of security vulnerability would a newly discovered flaw in a software application be considered? Uh, input validation flaw, HTTP header injection vulnerability, zero day vulnerability, time to check to time to use flaw. So we're talking about something that was newly discovered, um, so no one knew about it. Uh, I mean, that's just a, <laughs> that's a definition of a zero day vulnerability, not any of these, these other things. Um, which might have something to do, uh, I don't know, with different types of web apps or something like that. So let's go uh, zero day, 30C. Yep, 30C. Penetration tester discovered a web server running IAS 4.0 during their enumeration phase. The tester decided to use uh, MSADC dot pl attack script to execute arbitrary commands on the web server. While the script is effective, the pen tester found it too monotonous to perform extended functions. During further research, the penetration tester found a Perl script that runs the following uh, MS ADC commands. I'm going to let you kind of read through these because I'm not going to read all of them back, but we will kind of take a look at what's going on here. It looks like um, getting username and password to a temp file. And then uh, something with bin, and then based off of that, doing something with uh, netcat and um, some type of HTML page that says hacked. And then quitting. And then it looks like maybe doing some type of uh, FTPing of the file somewhere. So which exploit is indicated by this script? So it looks like you're kind of doing a few different things. I don't think it's a buffer overflow exploit. 
uh, chained exploit, I think is what it's going to be because chained exploits, it's normally kind of like you're doing multiple things. That's kind of what this looks like to me. Uh, SQL injection exploit, no, I mean, it doesn't talk about anything dealing with the SQL database and denial of service exploit. Uh, we don't really see anything like that. So let's go uh, chained exploit 31B. Let's see, 32. An insurance company has developed a new web application to allow their customers to choose and apply for an insurance plan. You've been asked to help perform a security review of the new web application. You've discovered the application was developed in ASP and uses MSSQL as its backend database. You've been able to locate the application search form and introduce the following code in the search input field. So it looks like uh, you're adding a few things in here. Let's see what the question is. When you click submit on the search form, your web uh, browser returns a pop-up window that says vulnerable to attack. What vulnerability did you discover in the web application? Uh, so it looks like you were running something and it would end up having an impact from your browser to whatever that that was connecting to um, on the back end that's that's the, the SQL stuff so just off the bat I think that that probably is something dealing with cross cross-site scripting um, talking about going from a browser and interacting uh, sending something and interacting with something on the remote end so I got cross-site request forgery command injection cross-site scripting or SQL injection I'm not going to go SQL injection because we're, well, I don't think that that's what that is. Let's go, since we're talking about web browser to website, I don't know, we'll roll the dice. Cross-site scripting, uh, 32C. Yep, 32C. Security analyst is conducting a log review of the company's web server and found two suspicious entries. Um, a GET request um, going to a web page with uh, a username and then another one with another name. Um, the analyst contacts the, the web developer and asks for a copy of the source code to the login script. And so we got uh, User, you do that. Pass gets that. SQL, we have a SQL query here. And then if doesn't equal zero, then authentication granted else. Authentication failed. So based on the source code analysis, what type of vulnerability is this web server vulnerable to? Um, So I think with that, when you put that, um, I think the single quote is going to allow you to do some SQL injection stuff. So command injection, SQL injection, directory traversal, or LDAP injection. Well, we're not dealing with LDAP at all here, so we can cross that off. Directory traversal, we aren't talking about actually doing any of that either. So command injection or SQL injection, since we're have it here in the code that we know that we're using SQL and we see that um, single quote mark we'll, we'll go SQL injection on that 33b yep all right uh, let's see while conducting a penetration test of organizations web applications you attempt to insert the following script into uh, the search form on the company's website script and you got the site uh, is vulnerable to attack. You then click the search button and a pop-up box appears on your screen showing the following text. The site is vulnerable to attack, right? Based on this response, what vulnerability have you uncovered in the web application? Buffer overflow, no. Cross-site forgery, no. Distribu distributed denial of service, no. This is very similar to that other question that we had. So we're talking about 
you know, browser to web server type of stuff. So let's go across site scripting, 34D. Yep, 34D. Okay. Um, a security analyst conducted an Nmap scan of a server and found that port 25 is open, which is for email. What risk might uh, this server be exposed to? Open file print sharing? No. Web portal data leak? No. Clear text authentication? No. Open mail relay? Yes. 35D. Bam. Okay. So that brings us to halfway through. That I'm going to take a break once we hit question 40. So let's knock out a few more of these. Um, which of the following characteristics of a blind SQL injection vulnerability? Administrator of the vulnerable application cannot see the request to the web server. Application properly filters user input but is still vulnerable to code injection in a blind attack. Administrator of the affected application does not see an error message during successful attack. Attacker cannot see any of the display errors with information about the injection during the blind attack. Um, I think it's the attacker cannot see. So let's go D, blind attack, 36, uh, 36D. Yep, cool. Uh, let's see, a pen tester is trying to map the organization's internal network. The analyst enters the following command, nmap dash n, which I think is for no DNS lookup, uh, hyphen, uh, S, capital S, which should be for uh, a SYN scan or stealth, st stealth scan. This T4 is going to make it go quicker. Um, and then the port 80 and then the whole subnet. So what type of scan is this? A quick scan, an intense scan, a stealth scan, or comprehensive scan. I said that the um, this hyphen lowercase s, uppercase s um, is going to be a SYN scan. So we will go with that. 37C. Let's see, what type of technique does exploit chaining often implement? Injecting parameters into a connection string using semicolons as a separator, inserting malicious Java code into input parameters, setting a user's SID to an explicit known value, adding multiple parameters with the same name in an HTTP request. Um, Let's go, so talk about doing multiple things with exploit chaining. Let's go injecting parameters into a connection string using semicolons as a separator. 38A, I'm not sure. Yep, 38A, good guess. I'll take it. Uh, let's see, which of these statements is true for LM hashes? LM hashes consist of 48 hexadecimal characters. I don't think so. LM hashes are based on AES-128. I don't think so either. Uppercase characters in the password are converted to lowercase. I don't think that's the case. LM hashes are not generated when the password length exceeds 15 characters. I believe that that is the case, and that's why we always talk about wanting to use longer passwords. Um, so let's see. That would be 39D. Yep, 39D. A penetration tester has exploited an FTP server using Metasploit. Now wants to pivot to the organization's LAN. What is the best method for a penetration tester to conduct uh, this type of pivot? You're going to need to do some type of routing change. Let's see. Issue the pivot exploit and set up Meterpreter. Issue the pivot exploit. I don't know what a pivot exploit is. I've never heard of that. Uh, reconfigure the network settings in Meterpreter. I don't know. I think if you do that, you might actually kill your connection. Set the payload to propagate through Meterpreter. Create a route statement in uh, Meterpreter. I think uh, I think that's probably it, because we want to add an additional route statement through that connection. Um, so let's do that. 40D. Yep. All right. I'm going to take another sip of water. Uh, if you got any questions or comments or want to say hello, go ahead and drop that in. I only got 30 questions left. I think this goes to 70, so. Uh, let's see. 
Your team is developing uh, an update to a piece of code that allows customers to update their billing and shipping addresses in a web app. The shipping address field uh, used in the database is designed to a limit of 75 characters. Your team's uh, web programmer has brought up some algorithms that might help prevent an attacker from trying to do a buffer overflow by putting too much into the shipping field. What pseudocode represents the best solution to prevent this issue? Um, so if shipping address is less than or equal to 75, update the field or else exit. That makes sense. That would say is equal to or greater than 75. That will cause you a problem. That specifically says anything uh, that's not 75 would be good. And that just says 75. So we want anything that's 75 or less. So 41D. A security engineer using Kali uh, is writing exploits in C++. What command should they use to compile their new exploit and name it notepad.exe? Uh, well, all of these all start with G++, okay? Um, and they all end in a hyphen O notepad exe. So I assume that's output. So then what are we left with? We know that the exploit is in C++. Uh, so C++, I only see a .cpp here and a .cpp here. I don't think that you're going to have to do a compile statement like that. I think, and I don't know that you need a dash i there. So let's just go exploit. Let's just say that they're putting the exploit script there and they're going to be compiling it and naming it notepad exe so let's go 42a yep 42a um, what should administrators perform to reduce the attack surface of a system and to remove unnecessary software services and insecure configuration settings harvesting <laughs> windowing hardening or stealthing Oh, that's, that's good. Um, I haven't heard those before. Uh, anytime that you are doing things uh, to improve the security of your device is going to be called hardening. So 43C. Yep, 43C. Uh, a hacker successfully modified the sale price of an item purchased through a company's website. During the inv investigation, analysts verified that the web server and Oracle database was not compromised directly. Okay. Um, the analyst also found no attacks that could have caused this during their log verification, uh, for, uh, with the IDS. So it wasn't an exploit on the software itself or the hardware. It wasn't something that would have been caught by IDS system. What is most likely the method the attacker used to change the sale price? Uh, SQL injection, changing hidden value, hidden form values buffer overflow attack, cross-site scripting. Um, I don't think that we would have been that SQL injection. I don't think so. Uh, buffer overflow attack, cross-site scripting, changing hidden value forms. Um, let's go changing hidden value forms, 44B. Yep. All right. Uh, an attacker was able to gain access to your organization's network closet while posing as a HVAC technician. While he's there, he installed a network sniffer in your environment. The attacker now wants to sniff all of the packets in the network. What attack should he use? Uh, a Fraggle, a Mac Flood, Smurf, or Teardrop? Um, I think in that case, you're going to want to uh, flood the Mac address table. And then uh, when you do that, that's going to cause a switch to end up sending all of the traffic in that VLAN out all ports um, until it's able to recover from that. So let's go uh, 45B. Yep, 45B. What programming language is most vulnerable to buffer overflow attacks? Swift, C++, Python, and Java. I'd say the one that we... Uh, don't see used all that much. Uh, we see Python, Java used a lot. 
I don't know. C++ seems pretty old. So, uh, yeah, let's go with C++, 46B. Yep. Uh, you've been hired to perform a web application test, security test. During the test, you notice the site is dynamic and therefore must be using a backend database. Uh, you decide you want to test to determine if the site is susceptible to SQL injection. What is the first character that you should use to attempt to break a valid SQL request? I think I mentioned that before. I think I said um, a single quote mark. Let's see, uh, semicolon, single quote mark, exclamation mark, double quote. Yeah, let's go single quote mark. Um, so 47B. Yep. Hey, Kiki, what's up? Appreciate you dropping in. Uh, let's see, 48, uh, what Nmap switch could a hacker use to attempt to see which ports are open on a target network? Um, okay, so we got hyphen S, O, hyphen, well, we'll just say with P, S, or U. Um, U is gonna be UDP only, S is going to be, um, that stealth scan, P is going to be ping. I think O is going to do like all of them. So let's go hyphen S uppercase O, 48A. Yep, 48A. Uh, your organization's network contains four subnets. 10.000, 10.01, 10.02, 10 10.03. Using Nmap, how can you scan all four subnets with a single command? All right, so that's all the same here. So really all we have an option of looking at is, is what these IP ranges are. Um, well, that one would be more than just a four subnet. So let's not go with that. That would be less than the four subnets. This kind of just looks like a cluster F to me. So I don't even know. Uh, I think this one where you have a range within um, within that particular octet. So let's go 49A. Yep, 49A. Um, let's see. An attacker has issued the following commands. Uh, NC for netcat, local with that L, and then the port 8080, and then he piped it, or she piped it, they piped it, somebody, somebody piped it, to netcat 192.168.1.76, um, 443. So based on this command, uh, what will occur? Netcat will listen on 176 interface for 443 seconds. No, that's, that's, that's garbage. Uh, Netcat will listen on port 8080 and output anything received to a remote connection on 176 port 43. Okay, maybe. I like that. Netcat will listen for a connection from 1.7. No, I mean, that's not doing that. Netcat will listen on port 8080 and output anything received to local interface. No. So the L here was for the local. That's going to be a remote connection. So let's go with uh, B. It's going to listen on 8080 and locally, and then output anything received a remote connection to 1.76 uh, for port 443. 50B. Yep, 50B. What tool can be used to scan a network to perform vulnerability checks and compliance auditing? Oh, we talk about it all the time. I don't even need to look at the answers. It's Nessus. Let's see. Okay, so Nmap. Nope. Nmap is going to be used for enumeration to see what devices are on a network. Metasploit is going to be used for actually exploiting those vulnerabilities. Nessus is going to be the correct answer. And Beef is uh, something that you can use if you're trying to trick people. Um, you can do spear phishing and stuff like that with it. I forget what the acronym for that stands for, but you can send malicious links to end up pointing them back to a web server that gets spun up there and then you can have them download malicious payloads. So uh, 51 C. Yep. 
An attacker is searching uh, in Google for Cisco VPN configuration files by using the file type colon PCF modifier. The attacker was able to locate several of these, now wants to decode any uh, connectivity passwords they may contain. What tool should the user attack? Or what tool should the attacker use? There we go. Um, so cup, Nessus scripting engine, cane enable, netcat. I don't remember cup. Nessus uh, scripting engine is really going to be used uh, for doing different types of vulnerability scanning. Uh, netcat, as we've seen in a few examples above, is for actually making different types of connections. So cane enable is something that you can use to actually crack passwords. So let's go um, 52C. An attacker is using the NSLOOKUP interactive mode to locate information on a, a domain name server. What command should they type to request the appropriate records for only name servers? All right, so all of these all end in equal NS. Um, transfer type, I don't think so. Set type, no. We're looking at request or, or locate. Um, attacker using NSA to, to locate. Uh, they got locate in the question. And, uh, you know, Kiki likes it whenever we do the try hack me stuff and they actually say like the word in the question. So we'll go with locate on this one. Uh, 53A. Let's see. 53A. Oh, no. All right. 53C. Set type uh, equals NS. Oh, well. It's harder than try hack me. That's good. Uh, let's see. 54. What Nmap switch would you use to perform operating system detection? Um, operating just, I just, just know this uh, from some of those try hack me labs we've done. If operating system detection, you're going to want to use the hyphen uppercase O. So 54D. Yep, 54D. What problem can be solved using Wireshark? Wireshark uh, we use for traffic analysis, packet captures, tracking source code versions, definitely not. Validating the creation dates of a web server, no. Uh, resetting the uh, administrative password on three different servers, no. Packet captures and analysis, there we go, 55D. There we go. All right, what tool is used to collect wireless packet data? Aircrack NG, John the Ripper, Nessus Netcat. It's going to be Aircrack NG. John the Ripper is used for uh, password cracking. Nessus, we already talked about vulnerability scanning. And Netcat, we already looked at stuff where it's used to make different uh, connections uh, to different types of devices. So 56A. Yep. Let's see. 57. What results will the following command yield? Nmap. Uh, we're doing a, self, a s stealth scan there. Uh, we're also looking for all um, OS fingerprinting using uh, ports. This is a range, so 80 through 443 going to this IP address. So I got stealth scan and all of that, so we can move over to the next part here. Scanning ports 80 and 443. Nope. Scanning ports 82443. Okay, well, we kind of were talking about that. Scanning all ports excluding, no. Determining, determining the operating system, which is what I said that was for, and scanning ports 80 to 443. I like that one. Let's go 57D. Yep. What type of weakness is John the Ripper used to test during technical assessments? I think I mentioned that up above, cracking passwords. Uh, so usernames, file permissions, firewall rule sets, or passwords. We're going to go 58D passwords. Okay. You're logged into Windows command prompt and want to find what systems are alive uh, in a portion of a Class B network. Okay. Using ICMP. What command would best accomplish this? Um, well, so... That's going to do you no good. That's going to do you no good. And it looks like down here we have kind of some, some scripting options. Now, 
what am I going to say is going to make me want to go with this? So if you're familiar with using ping and stuff coming back alive, you are going to get the, re the word reply in that uh, compared to the not responding uh, feedback that you're going to get when it's not there. So uh, let's go with this one since we're talking about what command would best accomplish this and you want to find the systems that are alive. Let's go with the one that is doing the scripting. Uh, it's going through the numbers within that subnet. Uh, it's uh, iterating through that and then also matching on uh, stuff that has the string reply in it. So 59D. Yep. Firewall administrator has configured a new DMZ to allow public systems to be segmented from the organization's internal network. The firewall has three security zones, uh, untrust, a DMZ, and a trusted. Um, the firewall administrator has been asked to enable remote desktop access from a fixed IP address on the remote network uh, to a remote desktop server in the DMZ in order for the CSO to be able to work from uh, his home office after hours. So what are we going to do here? Um, well, we talked about fixed IP addresses. So f looking at all of these right off the bat, I see some slash 24s, so we can automatically throw those out. We don't want to use the slash 24s. Uh, that's too, too broad. So that leaves us with this one, which is dot 32 going to dot 14. That one had a slash 24 and that one had a slash 24. So we're being specific here, um, as specific as we can. Uh, so let's go with 60 B. Yep. 60 B. Uh, Yeah, I mean, hey, I, I can write firewall rule sets all day long. <laughs> Let's see. A recently hired security employee at a bank was asked to perform daily scans on, the, on their intranet to look for unauthorized devices. The employee decides to create a script, scan the network every morning at 2 a.m. What programming language would you use to create that? Anything like that that's going to be easy and basic, I'm going to say you're going to want to use Python. Let's see what they got. PHP, C, Python, or ASP. Yeah, yeah. Just easy answer there, uh, 61, Python, uh, so 61C, 61C, yep. Uh, what must be developed in order to show security improvements over time? Reports, testing tools, metrics, taxonomy of vulnerabilities. Now, so if you are trying to show improvement, you need the numbers behind that, which means that you need the metrics. Um, so let's go 62, uh, C. Yep. What activity is not a part of the post engagement cleanup? Removing shells. We should do that. Removing a uh, tester created credentials. Get rid of those. Removing any tools you used. Yep. Modifying log files. That would not be good. Uh, so 63 D. Uh, what is not one of the three categories of solutions that all of the pen testers recommended mitigation should fall into? I mean, we talk about this all the time. I'm not even going to have it. people processes and technologies um, are kind of the things. And they got that there. People process technologies, right? Those are all the things that either cause problems or uh, things that you can improve on. Uh, so as far as solutions go, problems would not be a category of a solution. Uh, 64D. During a penetration test, you conduct uh, an exploit that creates a, a denial of service condition by crashing the HTTP server. What should you do? Immediately contact the organization and inform them of the issue. Yes. Continue with the exploitation. No. Pivot to another machine. No. Contact the organization's customer service department and conduct uh, further information gathering. No. If you actually jack something up, you need to contact whoever your POCs are for that uh, engagement and let them know what's going on. So let's go 65A. Yep. 
What term describes the amount of risk an organization is willing to accept? Risk appetite? Risk mitigation? No, risk mitigation is something you're going to put in place. Risk acceptance? No, risk. that's going to be uh, when you've done enough to put things in place. Um, and then they're going to accept that the risk is low enough. Risk avoidance is burying your head in the sand. Uh, so let's go risk appetite, 66A. Yep. Uh, during a penetration test, you find a hash value that is related to malware associated with an APT. What best describes what you found? Uh, indicator of compromise or IOC? Yes. A botnet? We have no idea if that's a botnet or not. Uh, SQL injection? No. XSRF, no. So what you found there is an indicator of compromise because you found the hash value. You haven't actually done anything with the program or whatever to actually do any testing with it. So it's just an IOC and you kind of go further from there. Uh, 67A. Yep. All right. What should not be included in your final report for the assessment and provided to the organization? Executive summary? Well, it definitely should be there. Methodology used? Yep, we can break that down. Findings and recommendations is the whole point. Detailed lists of costs incurred? No, let's not do, let's not do that. Uh, 68D. Yep. Uh, when you are managing a risk, what is considered an acceptable option? Reject it. Deny it. Mitigate it initiate it. Let's make no damn sense except for mitigate. So let's go 69C. All right. And the last question. After issuing the command telnet to uh, jasondeon.com over port 80 and connecting the server, what command is used to conduct a banner grab? Well, we actually saw that on one of the questions way, way, way back. Um, so going to do a head and uh, HTTP 1.1. So remember put is you're going to be like actually sending data to the web server. Head is just going to be like the just the top portion of that and the the, the banner stuff pretty much, uh, not everything else. So let's go 70A. Bam! That is it. That is all of the questions. Holy crap. So that... <laughs> That was 70 questions in an hour and 10 minutes. So uh, does anybody have any questions and comments while we're here? Uh, I actually thought that was pretty good. Uh, I tried to do uh, as good of a job explaining things, at least the best way that it, that I can for the things that I was familiar with. Some of those was a complete shot in the dark. Uh, some of that worked out sometimes and a few times it didn't. So what can you do? Appreciate everybody dropping in. Um, yeah, go check out the link for this if you want to do the exam yourself. Like I mentioned, have another link in the description for some of Jason Dion's other uh, stuff up on uh, Udemy. So that's pretty cool. Definitely go use that. He's well known for putting out good content. Uh, if nobody has uh, any other questions or comments or anything like that, we can uh, go ahead and wrap things up, I guess. Um, cool. All right. Well, hey, everybody have a good week. Keep an eye out for some new Try Hack Me stuff that I'll be throwing out there. Make sure you like the video, share the video, all that good stuff. All right. Have a good rest of your week. Talk to you later.